Good afternoon. So if you're in here to view the latest and greatest from the Applications Prototype Lab, you are in the correct location. Otherwise, please find your area of interest. So let's just go ahead and get started then. The Applications Prototype Lab is a group of um, 10 GIS nerds, right, Richie? Uh, located in Redlands. And um, when we get asked of uh, what we do, I'm usually saying we do get to play with the software. And then I'm seeing the eye rolls among my colleagues, and they're saying, no, Thomas, you can't say that anymore. That's just, it's not professional. So I'm practicing a new line on you. So how about we embrace the whole ArcGIS platform to explore and advance the science of where? How does that sound? But still, I'm going to say in the second sentence, we do get to play with the software. And you'll see some of that, um, what we're working on. Um, what we usually do is kind of like um, that we work on special projects, either um, out of strategic collaborations or corporate assignments, um, things that are coming down from, from Jack, who um, would like to see some things prototyped, an idea that he has, and so can we do that for this customer or this conference, and we'll get to play with the software. Or we try to get in with the co development team early in the development cycle, so we get to test the APIs as well as the new functionality in the software, and we're building um, demos um, around new functionality so that it is available for rollout. Um, another thing is every now and then we also get to play and prototype with existing hardware or new hardware, for example, um, with a HoloLens. Um, we were lucky enough to get a few of those devices and just see how we can fit those into a, the larger GIS context. So the demos with we're going to show you is kind of like what we worked on last year, um, what we're working on currently. And um, it's going to be a whirlwind of what we usually have to offer. As we're going through the practice sessions on getting our demos together, we realized that some of them might trigger some motion sickness. So We'll try to warn you, but if you do find yourself into the situation, just maybe look somewhere else for a little bit and we'll notify you when it's safe to look at the screen again. So with that, let's get started with, uh, with Richie and some fantastic web applications. Yeah, we're trying to, each year we're trying to minimize the complexity of our software or of the demos that we're showing, but, well, we like to live on the cutting edge, so. <coughs> Still some of the demos are developed as we speak, so please be patient. Thanks, Thomas. I'll be showing uh, five web applications. All of them are developed using the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. This first one we created a couple years ago, and we've recently done some, some tweaks to it. Uh, what this app did is it had these Landsat, over, uh, Landsat lenses, these uh, movable windows that we could use to swipe back and forth. Uh, these are mouse-driven windows we used to compare um, locations over time. This is 2010 versus 2017. If I bring up another window of 2005, it's quite interesting, this area in Dubai, there was very little construction five years earlier. Um, the change that we did is we added touch support. So with the iPad, um, iPhone, or any sort of touch device, we can grab one of these lenses with one finger and move it around. This is a touch screen laptop. Or with two fingers, we can rotate and resize these windows. This is multi-touch and multi-user, so I could have multiple people interacting at the same time, moving these lenses around. Um, sticking with Landsat theme, um, I'm looking for 
seen specifically for the Everglades in, in Florida. So I'm going to draw a bounding box around the Everglades and initiate a search against USGS's public um, service, Landsat service. And I'm only looking for recent images with minimal cloud cover. And we found 124 suitable images, and they're being stacked vertically in 3D based on the date of capture. Older scenes are at the bottom, and the newer scenes are at the top. These are small preview images that were downloaded. I can change the order of the stacking. For example, I may want to stack based on the sun's azimuth or the sun's altitude. But in this case, I'm, I'm looking for a recent image that has a minimal cloud cover. So I'm going to pick on one of these images. This is uh, taken in fe very recently, February, and it has 5% cloud cover. But let's see if there's something else underneath, which is also um, uh, fairly recent, but has a little bit less cloud cover. <coughs> Uh, this is another image. It has 1% December of last year. This, this fits my needs. So I can add this to the map, add it to the scene, or I can initiate a download of a high-resolution version, perhaps using a desktop product or including this image in a PowerPoint, PowerPoint presentation. This is a map of deadly heat waves that may occur in the future. If I set the map date to 2100, these are areas that may experience deadly heat waves. That's excessive mortality due to high heat and high humidity. If I pick on, again, Florida, it's going to tell me in the year 2100, there will be approximately 80 days which could experience deadly heat waves. That's excessive heat and temperature and humidity. Where is this data coming from? Uh, this is research for, by Dr. Mora out of the University of Hawaii. So this is based on a climate model which assumes these substantial decrease in the, car in the carbon um, greenhouse gases. If we were to not decrease the amount of greenhouse gases and use the present levels, it would be significantly different, worse. Uh, this is a polygon feature service that we developed a custom renderer for. Uh, you see in this you see a reflection, the sky's reflection in the water. And at, at the scale, we see a bit of a texture in the water. But if I was to zoom a bit lower, you see that the water is actually shimmering. It's see some, some movement in the water. So this is a custom renderer in the JavaScript API. So lastly, um, do we have any gamers in the room? Well, you love this. This is my... Xbox controller from home, and we developed a web app which recognizes the controller, and we have mapped we map the buttons on the controller and, and the axes to navigate in 3D and interact with objects. So this is the first demo where we do the motion sickness warning, but I have seen Richie's navigation skills, so I think we're safe. <laughs> uh, so just using regular standard uh, oops, sorry. I can navigate in 3D, movement, look angle, and also um, altitude, all at the same time. So this is, makes it, hang on, makes it much easier to navigate around, actually go between buildings, go under buildings. For example, I don't think you could do this with a mouse. Whoa. So with the A button, it's not shooting. It's actually display the attribute window. And with the bumper bars, the, the upper bumper buttons, we can iterate through this web scene's published slides. So this is a web scene that someone's captured these different view angles. This will work with any web scene. Um, yeah, I'm all done. Carol? Is there anything special you need, um, the computer needs to support in order to make this? It uh, has, has to be a Windows machine. That's it. Okay, thank you. And now, um, Carol will show us some new algorithm development um, that will be coming up fairly soon. 
Hello, everybody. Uh, centrality is a concept used in graph or network theory, network theory being a set of techniques for analyzing graphs. Ecologists have used it in recent years to understand how animals might move through their remaining habitats. We used it in the Green Infrastructure Project last year to find the areas most important to maintain connectivity between the identified cores. Here you are looking at intact habitat cores from ArcGIS Online. The three green colors, from light to dark, indicate good to best ecological value. Zoomed in, we can see the connectors, or the lines, shortest paths between the cores. After analyzing this network for between the centrality, the result was this layer, showing cores symbolized by connectivity importance. These areas have a relatively higher importance for potential animal movement than those shown as best on the other layer. Our colleague Bob Grote did a vast amount of work on green infrastructure. To extend that work and to make centrality concepts available to you for your work, Bob has written Python tools that incorporate the betweenness and other algorithms from the Network X Python library. The tools are in this graph analysis toolbox. <coughs> to demonstrate, let's switch from ecology to another use case. Suppose a large internet retailer wanted to locate another distribution warehouse in the US. Which urban area might be the best? Carol. Yes. Any guesses who this retailer might be? Uh, no, the retailer shall remain nameless, but its initials are Amazon. Amazon? Okay. <laughs> no, it's actually, they're, they're looking for a... They're looking for a headquarter, headquarters. not for a warehouse, yes. Totally different and analysis, absolutely. With all absolutely. their requirements, they really should use ArcGIS to find theirs, but we digress. <laughs> there are many existing ArcGIS siting tools. Uh, we're going to use the node centrality tool. The input is a least cost path network, a polyline layer created with the spatial analyst cost connectivity tool using the closest cost neighbors option. We made our network here with urban areas and major roads. Once we have the input, we set the starting and ending nodes, the path cost and the centrality algorithm that we want to use. These are the ones currently available. And we're going to stick with betweenness. And just as a reminder, betweenness measures how often a node lies along optimum paths between all the other nodes in a network. The output of the tool is a table that we can join to the urban areas and symbolize on the calculated betweenness value. So you've done that here. Here we are symbolized with graduated colors, red having the highest value, and down through, oh, sorry, wrong one. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> um, I got to play around only with symbolization, so I found that the, <laughs> Proportional symbols made things stand out better for me. And here you can see that Chicago, maybe Atlanta are the best areas for our nameless retailer. <laughs> so we have, have we passed on our analysis results to the unnamed retailer? No. Not yet? No. Okay. But I'll send out the email fairly soon. If the price is right, I'll, I'll show them. Yeah. <laughs> because between the centrality depends on how many optimal paths are in the network, we should expect different results for a smaller network. So I'm going to run this on this subset of urban areas and roads that's in the Midwest. When we are finished with that and symbolize, here we see that St. Louis has a higher between a centrality value and is better than Chicago. That look, go ahead. 
I hope some of you will try to experiment with these centrality concepts and tools. The toolbox isn't quite ready for release, but when it is, we will put a post on our blog. And thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. And now we're vent venturing out into the mobile world, and Mark will ta take us on, to, on a tour around the world. Oh, no, Vancouver. Around we're Android. focusing on Vancouver. <laughs> yeah, so um, this is an application that I built using the uh, recently released Quartz Runtime 100.2.1 release, uh, SDK for Android. And uh, this is an app that I'm right now running on a Google Pixel C Android tablet. And I specifically wanted to show off some of the new 3D capabilities. Um, so this, um, the SDK is now able to show uh, both 3D object data and integrated mesh data. In this case, we see um, Vancouver, Canada, and the data is courtesy of our friends at Vricon. So the 3D team has put a lot of work into the mobile SDKs to make sure that the uh, scene display can pan, rotate, zoom, and tilt smoothly. But uh, my goal with this application was to build extra custom functionality and show that it, how it could be used to extend what's already in the SDK. So I built a series of tools to do that. The first of those is a measure tool. And when I tap a location, in this case a building of interest, it gives me a rough distance and heading to that point that I tapped from my observation location in space. And it marks both the observation and destination point using 3D graphics as well as text labeling on the line connecting them. Another tool or another set of tools that the SDK now includes are a couple of um, on-screen visibility analysis tools. Line of sight lets you drag a sight line around the scene and it will interactively show you which portions of that sight line are visible and which portions are obscured by buildings or other objects in the scene. Um, along the same lines, the viewshed analysis uh, takes that concept and kicks it up to another higher dimension, giving us a 360 degree um, report on visibility from a given point. And it uses the device's uh, graphics processing unit and it does it so quickly that you can actually see the building shadows move as the observation point moves. And it turns it into kind of an interesting, sometimes fun um, interactive exploration tool. So on top of this, I thought, okay, I've got this analysis. Let me step down into the shoes of the observer on the ground. Let me put myself into the scene as an observer. So I've got a zoom button on the lower right that will zoom the camera down into the action. Okay, so. Now this is another one of those times where if you're prone to motion sickness, this might be uh, a little iffy. But I included a sensor navigation virtual reality mode that uses the device's gyroscopic sensors to allow me to pan and rotate the display as I move the device around. And in addition, you can use a finger to move the display so you can uncover what was previously obscured. And then use a return button to go back to your original point in space. And finally, um, I built a pivot lock tool that uses the SDK's new uh, camera controller classes to let me tap a point of interest and set the display on a slow rotation around that point focused on that point of interest. So this application source code is now available in a public GitHub repo and you can find it by looking on our blog. I just put up a blog post yesterday, and at the end of that blog post is a link to that public Git repo. Now on to my colleague, Vitold Franchek, for some JavaScript applications. Before we switch, Mark. Yes. I do have a question for you. Yes. Which mobile device do you like better, Android or iOS? Oh, I'm an Android fan, definitely all the way, but um, my colleague Al will have a different opinion on, on that, I'm sure. Yes, I'll ask the next mobile presenter the same question, so we'll see who wins.
Oh, ask the audience, sure. Show of hands, who prefers Android? I think that's the majority. I don't <laughs> think we need to ask the other question. <laughs> Too embarrassing. <laughs> and iOS users? Oh. Wow. It actually is majority Android. That's interesting. Thank you. On Thank to you, Vito. Thank you, Thomas. I have two applications to demonstrate to you two this afternoon. For the first one, it's about sea surface temperature. We have 10 years, old, 10 years of daily data on sea surface temperature for the entire globe. The data was measured at, uh, for every location at noon of every, every day of this 10, 10 years long period. And the latest one comes from literally yesterday, which is March 6. <clears throat> the, date, the diagram in red here in the lower left corner of the screen represents daily changes in sea surface temperature at the ocean at the point that I just clicked before. Now when I clicked another point on the ocean, this time Pacific, you see a little bit different pattern of sea surface temperature. When I move this slider, time slider or year slider back a year, now we see uh, the yearly changes in sea surface temperature at this location. Now, well, I can also click on the diagram and see the updated map of sea surface temperature, <clears throat> which, was, which happened to be, I mean, with the, the warmest at this point was uh, water was on October 8th, while the coldest happened to be on March 10th, and in a moment we'll see a, a map displayed for, for that particular date. <clears throat> So it is March 10th, and you can see it's much cooler. And in a, mo a moment ago, I said that we have a sea surface temperature data, but it's actually the data includes also all major lakes of the world. So when I click on Lake Michigan, for instance, we'll see a diagram of daily changes in uh, Lake Michigan at this location for the year 2017. And of course, it is not always as cold. I mean, it, here it says that it was only 42 degrees Fahrenheit on <coughs> March 10th, but <coughs> on August 3rd, it was, um, <coughs> excuse me, thank you, 74 or 75 degrees Fahrenheit. The data, this, this water surface temperature data was calculated using satellite infrared, infrared imagery and the source of data, I mean, the, the owner of the data is NOAA. Spatial resolution is 10 kilometers. And um, this uh, web application was developed using <coughs> JavaScript API 4 by our colleague, John Grayson. I have one more application, which is <coughs> similar. Actually, it has a map and a time and a diagram at the bottom. And this one represents heat events in the United States and northern Mexico. These are displayed in the shades of red on the map. And the, the, the shades of red shown here represent the number of days per year with the temperature exceeding 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So, for, for the given location, which happened to be San Bernardino County in California, this is where Redlands is, is located. We, this year, and you know, how do I make sure that, you know, this year, 2017, we'll, no, the last year, sorry, the last year we had seven, 67 days of when the temperature exceeded uh, that threshold. But the data covers 150 years. So it, it starts from 1950, when it, we, we had only 44 days, and it goes up to almost 130 days per, per year with this temper, temperature. When I click on another location, we'll see data for Mariposa County in Arizona, and in this case, in terms of 130, as for San Bernardino County, we had almost 200 days. So when you look at the diagram, you can 
see a clear trend in growing temperatures. Now we have a play button here, which triggers an animation of maps, uh, which that you know are displayed, uh, and the maps represent every 10 years in, in time. And at the bottom you see the number of days where the temperature will exceed, or is projected to exceed 200, sorry, 195 degrees Fahrenheit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vitold. I guess I'm detecting another trend here that besides the weather, our demos are getting hotter as well. So, let's switch pace a little bit. And I was inspired by, by Richie's demo. So, I, would, I wanted to use this beautiful device as well, but I wanted to use my favorite premier desktop application in ArcGIS Pro. So, I wrote an add-in for ArcGIS Pro. And in case every, not everybody is, has yet memorized um, Richie's proposed standard of the use of gamepad controllers for ArcGIS, if you hover over the, uh, our little tool, you're getting the clues on what controllers or what elements on the controller um, are in charge for the navigation. So when we engage the tool, we're putting a little indicator icon um, in the center of the screen so that you um, are aware that we are now in navigation mode. So controlling X and Y, um, um, the elevation, which in, our, in the 2D environment would equate to the scale, and the rotation. So in this case, we're actually showing off very nicely the vector tile base map, and as you can see that the labels maintain their orientation even while we are rotating the screen. This is very nice. Um, similar to what Richie has shown you, with, you're using the bumper to go toggle between the different bookmarks. And if you're finding one that has actually um, feature data, we can use the A button um, to trigger the pop-ups to explore the details of our vector data in more detail. Now, being the powerful desktop application that ArcGIS Pro is, we can also switch from 2D to 3D. And now we're getting a little bit into the dicey territory because my navigation skills are way worse than Richie's. No, I mean, Richie is excellent. I mean, I'm aspiring gamer, let's put it this way. This is not quite the area where we would like to be. Um, so let's go to the Grand Canyon and see if I can induce some reaction from the audience. Whoa! But all joking aside, let's finish up with the Hollywood shot as we're zooming out to the extent of the globe. And so this extension or this add-in will be made available um, pretty shortly via announcement through our Art APL blog site. So please stay tuned. And now we're switching to another mobile section. Once we switch displays. See, it's always the Apple that requires special attention. Does it work? Yeah. Now switch the input. All right. That was as smooth as the last time. I'm going to show you two applications built with iOS 11. Um, the first one. I'm actually, there's a lot of different uh, platforms and technologies using this. Um, it's not just a camera. It's using um, the AR kit in iOS 11 plus RGS Runtime SDK for iOS, um, as well as it's using the Vision API from Apple. Also, 
um, artificial intelligence model for common objects, as well as speech API. This is really getting hot. ARKit, it helps to be able to build these point clouds in yellow, as you can see. The RGS runtime SDK for iOS with AR and VR that's right now in beta is going to be able to display points as we collect in them. So using the speech API, the first thing that we can do Sorry, using the Vision API, the first thing that you can do is to actually be able to point uh, devices or items around the room. The speech API microphone. And this speech API will be able to tag objects as well and their coordinates and, and the point cloud, the closer point cloud is actually an anchor uh, on the screen. Or letting the Vision API, an artificial intelligence API that you can see on the top, uh, be able to create a guess of um, the object found around the room. You can go around, and all these objects have been placed now on a feature service, uh, knowing the GPS of the device, plus how far away they are from that device uh, with a point cloud, the distance, the depth, all that, and being able to be uploaded into RGS online. You can go along and, of course, uh, you think that Dave is a laptop. Um, so this is the first um, application built with RGS Runtime SDK with iOS. Let's switch. And I'm going to show you another one. Using ARKit and RGS Runtime, we placed all the planets on uh, GPS coordinates and tried to scale it down a little bit more than it is right now, uh, giving you the, the sun and different planets around, and put them inside the room. As you can see, it's creating point cloud and trying to place it. Um, we had to update the solar system just because a new object got added by SpaceX. It's going around Mars at this time. Um, oh, a new planet has passed around it. Um, as you can see, this is both built using ARKit from iOS and also using the runtime to be able to coordinate and put the orbits and just a simple animation, um, even though this um, in a circular motion. That's pretty much it. I'm going to pass to Dave. Do you want to switch? Before we switch, though, Al, a question for you as well. Which one do you prefer, iOS or Android? I love Android because like that, um, they push iOS to be better. <laughs> Thank you for those insights. On to you, Dave. OK. Well, I think it was a, uh, oh, this fell off right here. Just a moment. So you may all recall uh, during a plenary session that Rohit um, Singh showed a, a Jupyter notebook uh, doing location allocation analysis to find new locations for ALS clinics. That was a, I won't show it to you again right now, that was a, a notebook that we developed here in the lab uh, in uh, collaboration with uh, our good colleague from Esri, Pat Dolan, who we see in this picture right here. Now, uh, Pat was actually diagnosed with ALS about a year and a half ago, and this picture shows Pat with his therapist, Joyce, his occupational therapist. She's taking measurements of his hand to measure the uh, the progress of therapy to improve his grip and ability to extend his fingers. Now Joyce takes the, these uh, numbers and she just stores them in a spreadsheet. So Pat and I got to thinking about, well, how could we visualize this data in a GIS? And we realized that we could do this in City Engine. 
So that's not city engine. This is city engine. So here's what you normally think of with city engine. You think of a skyline like this, and you know, you can navigate through a city and look at the different buildings from different angles. But this uh, train station we're looking at right here isn't really a train station. This is actually a hand. So this is a model of Pat's left hand. So we took those measurements that Joyce had in her spreadsheet and we brought them into this model as city engine rules. So we can actually visualize the progress of therapy on Pat's hand. So this was his grip in July of last year. And this was his grip a month later in August and his grip after another month of therapy in September. So Pat told me that when he saw this visualization, he felt really motivated to continue with this therapy because he was able to see how therapy was actually improving his grip. He was able to visualize it. And so to that, I say, Pat, more power to you. That's my presentation. Thanks, Dave, for this quite um, novel usage of uh, City Engine. Looks pretty good. So to finish us off, we have John with some, do you have any motion sickness inducing material? No, nobody complained about that last session, so I think we're okay. Okay, we might be safe. So on to you, John. Thank you, Thomas. Um, the first couple of demos I'm gonna show here uh, use the same data set that VTOL showed earlier. It is a data set coming from NOAA showing future heat events. Uh, in this first application, um, I'm combining the NOAA future heat events with some projected population data from the EPA. In this case, both data sets had information for the same years, which allowed me to just simply create a little slider that would update both data sets. Um, additionally, I added a filter to the NOAA future heat events that would restrict the amount of information on the display. In this case, we're looking for all those locations where there's gonna be at least two months where the temperatures are over 95 degrees, and then we can actually overlay that on top of the EPA projected population for that year. So in this case, there's gonna be more people and there's gonna be more heat. The second application, uh, once again, uses the NOAA future heat event information, but in this case, we are overlaying it on top of information from the CDC, in this case, Social Vulnerability Index. So the CDC has generated the Social Vulnerability Index across the US for each of the counties, and they also have subcategories for the index that look at specific uh, uh, parts of that index. So once again, we can, just like before, we can change the year and we can filter out for specific parts of the year. Um, in this case, we are using those areas under the severe heat to filter out the CDC most vulnerable counties and show a list of the top 10 most vulnerable counties under those, that particular heat event. We highlight the top most affected county and then for that county we show the breakdown such as some population information or what contributed to that overall CDC vulnerability index and all of the subcategories as well. And as we can see here, these are the most vulnerable for the overall index, but if we wanted, we can actually switch over to one of the sub-indices. And now we have a different set of most vulnerable counties based on this particular uh, part of the vulnerability index. The next application I'm gonna show is a recent USGS earthquake application. These are earthquakes for the last seven days. This is the latest iteration of our earthquake app. If you don't have an earthquake app, I go out there and build one. Everybody needs a good earthquake app. Uh, what, this, uh, what this application is doing is showing us counts of number of earthquakes for the last week, and we can easily switch to a particular day, and we can see the earthquakes as they progress over the week, or we can actually just look at the earthquakes just for that day. And the other thing that we've done as well is show a couple of different ways of, of displaying or aggregating that, those earthquake information, in this case, count by hour and magnitude. And we've come up with a couple of different ways of displaying that information in those little tiny charts um, that allows us to look at the information but also filter 
the information as well based on, on the selected values. And the same thing goes for the actual magnitude itself, where we can see there's been a lot of smaller earthquakes than not that many big ones over the last week. And of course, every good earthquake app needs a little ability to be able to animate through it. And here's uh, the earthquakes over the last week. Are you trying to tell us something for Southern California? No, the data speaks for itself. Okay. Um, the next application uh, is uh, an application I put together in conjunction with John Nelson, one of our cartographers and one of his former students, who had looked at the placement of campus blue lights. Now, the campus blue lights are uh, very common in campuses. They are locations where the students can go up and hit the big button that says, I need assistance, and normally there's a big blue light above it. And so we were looking at the placement of these blue lights in the campus setting. Now, the original analysis was done by taking all the building footprints and burning them into the elevation data set, running view shed analysis, and it was all done on the back end. Um, what I did is I said, well, what if we just kind of think about this as a 2D geometry problem instead? Uh, so it allows me to create the interactive experience by simply clicking on the map and placing those blue lights and then discovering the intersection with those buildings. And because we're doing everything client-side, it allows me to build a very interactive experience and also show the results on the display. As we place them, we're showing the total visible area for all of the view sheds and also the overlap area. The idea being is that you want to maximize the visible area while minimizing the overlap. So as we interactively pick up and move the location of the blue light, we get some immediate feedback as to whether or not that's actually a good location for that, that blue light. Uh, once you're done with the placement of the lights, you can save it out to a hosted service on arcgis.com, and now it becomes part of the entire system and you can bring it into other, other places as well. The, uh, this next application uh, builds on some other work that we did, we've done previously, and that is looking at the elevation information that is being used in the display for some visual analytics. And this is a concept that we see now showing up in a lot of the APIs that are being released. And in this case, we're just gonna do a simple view shed. We click on the location and boom, right away there's our view shed. Uh, we can increase the analysis distance or the observer offset and our analysis is automatically updated. And because we're doing all, the, all of this client side, we can start creating these very interactive visual analytic experiences. The other thing that we also did is said, well, if we can do it for a point, you know, why not along a path? So uh, for this tool, we keep an aggregated set of the results as we move the cursor around, we regenerate just for the current location and then aggregate them as, as we move along, all in a very interactive uh, manner. The, uh, the next application is something I'm currently working on. I'm, I'm not finished, but I thought I'd go ahead and show it anyway. Uh, the idea here is to show profiles along a certain distance away from the camera position. In this case, we're doing 25 kilometer intervals and we're showing, putting them all into a graph so if we, uh, if we actually change the camera position, it should go back out, regenerate those 25 kilometer intervals, generate the profile, and overlay them on top of the graph. So this is very preliminary. Uh, having the profiles at 25 kilometer intervals is, is okay. What I wanna do next is look at the mountain peaks that are currently in the view and try to come up with a way of prioritizing them and say these are the most relevant mountain peaks and then generate profiles along those particular mountain peaks so we have a, more, uh, a better uh, chart of the horizon profiles. Um, sometimes we get asked to work on applications that don't involve a map. Sometimes we get asked to build tools to help understand the content that you might have in your Ar ArcGIS Online organization. Uh, this is such an application where we are looking at the specific subset of information that is available in your organization and looking at the relationships between those items. In this case, we can look at a group or a folder or we can look at multiple groups, and we're just playing a little chart of those items, normally centered around a particular server, and then we have the services, and we have layers, and we have maps, and if we want to get more information about a particular map, all we have to do is just double click on it, and it's gonna show us the relationships associated with that map. 
along with a list of all of the items or services that are being used in our organization. So it's just another way of looking at the content in your organization and, and visualizing it. And um, I got one more demo I'm gonna show. Uh, this is a, Ooh. a service of uh, is this slideware Geo? information. Is this GeoEvent? This is a stream service coming from a GeoEvent server. Uh, and this, these are current flights. I think there's like a five minute delay that, that Flutterware puts in. And so we can see all of the flights this is a global service. Um, in this case, we're using a little bit of Firefly symbology because everybody needs Firefly symbology. And uh, what we're gonna do is as soon as we get in really close, we're gonna switch the render to use some directed arrows. So in this case, we're using the JavaScript API and some visual variables that are actually gonna manipulate the, the symbology, not only the direction, but whether or not it's actually gonna point down or up based on attributes that are coming through the feed itself. And of course, we can do some labeling of the airports or the flights as well. And that, I believe, is it. Um, unless we have time, you want me to show anything else, Thomas? No, I think we're good. Okay. We'll switch us back to number three. Yes. So to finish up our demonstration, our presentation, um, the first one is a link where you find uh, most of our um, online web applications that we have shown today. Um, the link might change in the future, so I would like you to pay attention to actually to our blog or our site on, on the GeoNet. So if you just put in um, or search for APL, the Applications Prototype Lab on on um, GeoNet, we will point you all, you will find our blog post where we are uh, maintaining kind of current entries of current work that's going on, something that we cannot sh uh, share, um, but giving you um, tips and tricks on how we did certain um, ideas and applications that we've, sh that we've shown today. Um, please do fill out the survey for this presentation and if there are any questions, we would like to take them, or please do come up and talk to the developers as the presentations were shown to you right here. Thank you very much. <laughs>